I've had the pleasure of doing well over 100 weddings. Would you be surprised if not many brides and grooms request that scripture passage? <laughs> Occasionally. Not very often do I have a bride and groom that want me to stand up there and read lives and be subject to your husbands. But it is a text that contains some wonderful teaching that can be recovered. Uh, a couple that I had the pleasure to get to know before they passed away were one of the many couples that I've had the joy of knowing who demonstrated such an amazing marriage. He would give the most immaculate care to her car. His car set in the driveway, his car that was, was the one that was in the weather, whenever they used his car, they always had to clean off the snow. Hers was the car that was parked inside their one car. It was immaculate inside and out. Tucked underneath the windshield wiper was a slip of paper where he recorded the date that he changed the oil, whenever he rotated the tires, whenever he drove around the block. He drove it around the block because she didn't drive. And given her health, she was never going to drive again. But he parked her car in the garage. Jesus wants us to have those kind of relationships, whether they're spousal, parent-child, our neighbor, our co-worker, Jesus wants us to have those kind of relationships. The text that, uh, that Ashley read today, at first blush, uh, maybe proposes a different kind of relationship, but I would challenge you to find in Paul's writings where he says that a woman should obey a man. If you keep reading after what she read, you'll see Paul saying, children need to obey their parents, and awkwardly enough, slaves need to obey their masters. He never says, woman should obey a man. In preparation for weddings, I've sometimes offered to slip that line into the highest bidder. <laughs> I've never had someone foolhardy enough to take me up on the offer. You can't imagine the post-wedding counseling that might <clears throat> demand. This is another one of Paul's writings in Galatia, uh, to the church in Galatia. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Paul has this as sort of the opening to what Ashley read. To me, this is sort of the window to what Paul sees as the relationship that Jesus wants for all of us. That we'll be subject to one another out of reverence. That's the life-giving relationship. Sadly, that doesn't always happen, does it? For a myriad of reasons, and we don't have time to go through all of them, so I just kind of grouped four big groupings. There's the basics. How often are our relationships sort of, uh, well, havoc is wrecked upon those relationships because of stress from the basics of life. We're worried about job security or a house that won't sell. Or where is our food coming from tomorrow because the pantry is empty and so is the bank account. Those types of stresses wreak havoc upon nearly every relationship that we have. There's the brokenness that we brought with us into the relationship. The brokenness handed on to us from generations before us. Where we maybe saw one parent dominate another parent in ways that weren't healthy. Or parents that treated children in ways that were less than respectful. And if that's all we know, and that's all that we've seen, it's hard to step outside of that as we step into the next relationship. And so often we bring that baggage with us, and it wreaks havoc upon every other relationship we have. We have the priorities of life. Sometimes we get them backwards. Sometimes we begin to put money and material goods ahead of the people in our lives. And that wreaks havoc upon our relationships. And then sometimes there's just the peer group that we hang out with. Sometimes we find ourselves with a set of friends who enjoy all of our stories that are more about conflict and drama and chaos. And as their re reaction reinforces us telling those stories, eventually we find ourselves leading a life that creates those stories. Because that's the friendship group that I'm with. Rather than a friendship group that maybe reinforces the less dramatic, 
the less exciting, but the more life-giving, healthy, joyful, encouraging kind of relationships in our life. There is so much within and without us that works against what Paul's trying to see to it, give to us. That sometimes it's just plain radical to think about in our society living a life like this. This to me is the heart of what Jesus and what Paul is trying to show us that Jesus would love to see in all of our relationships. That we would treat each other the way Christ treats the church. That our relationship to each other would be like Jesus' relationship to the church. We look at Jesus' leadership. How often is he calling people into relationship in a healthy way? Whether he's calling the woman at the well, who is an outcast from her community, back into relationship with the community where she lived. And how that inspired her so that she went and shared the love of Jesus with that entire community. And they all came out to see who was this man at the well. Or the way in which Jesus shapes the twelve who followed him most closely. So that their relationship with each other, as different as they were from each other, would be strong enough that they could lead the church through the adversity of oppression and through the celebration of resurrection. Jesus is continually trying to inspire these kind of life-giving relationships. A teenage boy went to the physical therapist. Part of the exercises that the physical therapist was teaching included this sort of stout rubber band, kind of long. The physical therapist would hold on to one end as she sat facing the boy, and the boy would hold the other end, and then he would stretch and twist as it strengthened his muscles. And after they had done these about a half a dozen times, the physical therapist named for the boy what had already been happening, and that was their trust relationship. He was trusting her not to let go, and she was trusting him not to let go. And as she named it, you could see at first the aha in his eyes as he thought about how funny it would be if he did let go. <laughs> Quickly replaced by the appreciation that she had never let go. That is to be a beautiful microcosm of what Paul is talking about. Those two had a trust relationship that they would not let go, and it led directly to healing in the boy's back. What if our relationships on a daily basis share that kind of trust? As Christians, I think we're inspired with a faith that leads us to do that. Because we are able to risk the hurt from the other person who might let go. Because we already know the reward from the one who promises to never let go. We've seen the sacrifice by Jesus Christ who placed us before himself. And because we've seen that, and we know that, we're enabled to take that kind of trust into the next relationship. The healing of Jesus Christ that can take away some of that brokenness that is so often the baggage that we carry from one relationship into the next, or from one generation to the next. If we let Jesus take that away and replace it with the trust that he's earned from Maybe we don't have to pass that along from generation to generation to generation. If each day we start our day lifting our relationships up to Jesus in prayer, giving those over to Jesus in prayer, then we can allow Jesus to carry some of that broken and the brokenness that we were carrying ourselves, and instead enjoy the healing that comes from that kind of risk and trust and reward. And then as we practice with this other person, this not letting go, that becomes more familiar than the being cast aside. And as the holding on becomes more familiar, our trust becomes more confident, and the depth of our relationship grows. Why does the man park his wife's car in the garage when she's never going to drive it again? Maybe because he's trying to love her through the physical ailments of her life that will eventually take her life. And sometimes he doesn't know what else to do to demonstrate his love, but he can take care of that car, even when he can't always take care of her. You've read the creation stories. You've read the, you know, there's two of them. There's the one where Eve is created out of one of Adam's ribs. 
And too often we've seen this spun out as, well, if she's made out of one of his leftover parts, what does that say about her? But I think instead what God is saying, I made Eve out of Adam's side because they should always walk side by side. Mutually submissive, mutually serving, mutually loving. These are the things that build this kind of relationship. That models the relationship that Jesus wants to have with you on a personal basis. This week in preparing for the sermon, I watched a, a little video clip. It was a young couple, late 20s, they were a month before their wedding, and some makeup artists came in to make them up as what they would look like as they aged. So the two couples are sitting, facing away from each other. The film fast forwards as the makeup artists come in and do all their work. Then it would hit about year 50, and they turned and looked at each other at 50 years old. As I first watched, I thought, this is going to be hilarious. Because I look in the, in the mirror every morning, and that's pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Watching myself age is kind of funny. So I thought, this, this is going to be a comic, you know, little video clip as they turn around. But that's not what happened. As they looked at each other at age 50, at age 70, at age 90, the comments were, they were inspiring. There was tears coming down. He would say, wow, I, I hope you look this amazing when you're 70. She would say, I hope I take better care of your hair. <laughs> but at one point, they both kind of commented, as I look at you at age, which at 50, 79, I'm already imagining all the memories that we've collected by the time we get there. How much opportunity have I had to love you by the time I get there? I'm hearing the voice of two people who are already loving the other person more than themselves. And they're not looking at the other person thinking, Wow, that's what I'm going to wake up to. But instead, that is what I'm going to wake up to. And you can see the joy in their eyes as they thought about the future that was before them and how they could share that together and how much more they were going to love each other and know each other in the wintertime of the relationship than in the springtime where they were on that day. Jesus wants this for you. Jesus wants this for you so much that Jesus gave up his life for you. And then gives you the chance to share that with all the relationships in your life. 